guys, this is the lesson for Friday, February the 19th. Um, to get ready for this lesson, I want you to open up Blood on the River, open up Chapter 6 Quiz. Make sure that um, you are caught up in all your missing works when we start back next week. You don't have any missing assignments. If you're not sure what missing assignments that you have, um, then make sure you reach out to uh, Miss Maddox or to myself. And we would be more than happy to tell you what it is that you need to get turned in. Also, um, make sure you've turned in yesterday's quiz, chapter four and five quiz. If you have not yet read chapters four and five and finished that quiz, you need to go back and do that before you do today's lesson, which we'll be reading chapter six and um, doing that quiz. And that's all that we'll be doing today is reading chapter six and doing the quiz. I'm going to read chapter six to you. So um, if you would rather just read it yourself, you can go ahead and stop the video, read it yourself, and take the quiz, or you can have the quiz pulled up, and you can be working on the quiz. Um, the questions are in order while I read it to you. So this is chapter 6, page 35, in Blood on the River. And the epigraph at the beginning of the chapter says, Whilst we remained at this island, we saw a whale chased by a thresher and a swordfish. They fought for the space of two hours. We might see the thresher with his flail lay on the monstrous blows, which was strange to behold. In the end, these two fishes brought the well to her in, and that's by Master George Percy in Observations. All right, chapter six. These islands are strung together, much like beads on a necklace. While we sail past one, in half a day we catch sight of another. I sneak up on deck so often my back is sore from being smacked with that oar. But the sky and water are so blue, and everything is so new I keep coming up anyway. It's hot. We boys and common men abandoned our shoes, stockings, doublets, and slops weeks ago. Now even the gentlemen go around with their white knobby knees peeking out from under their long shirt tails. We anchor near the island of Guadalupe, and Captain Newport takes several men ashore to explore. While the boats are anchored, we passengers are allowed up on deck, and so I stand at the railing to watch the long boats glide through water clear as turquoise glass. A strong hand closes on my arm, and I startle. It's Captain Smith. Look he says, pointing. A huge black form comes racing through the sea. Close behind it are two smaller forms. It's a type of whale, the biggest fish in the sea, Captain Smith says. Then he smiles strangely. It's being chased. The three fish disappear behind the discovery, then reappear on the other side. What would chase a whale, I ask. Looks like a swordfish and a thresher shark, says Captain Smith. We will see who wins. The whale surfaces and spurts out a spray of air and water, in that moment, the thresher rears up its tail and lands a tremendous blow on the whale's snout. The whale is stunned. He tries to escape, but the swordfish swims in to cut him. Bright red blood swirls into the clear water. The thresher lands another harsh blow and another. The whale becomes confused, swims in circles. The swordfish darts in and out, cutting and slicing. Soon the once blue water is murky with blood. As the whale slows, the thresher deals more slamming blows, and the swordfish cuts again and again. Finally, the whale rises to the surface, spurts a stream of spray one more time, then rolls over belly skyward. Captain Smith has a satisfied look on his face, as if his regiment has just won a battle. You see how it is when you've left the confines of England? He asks me. You might have been born the biggest fish in the sea, but the skill and perseverance of those lower born can take you down and destroy you. Somehow I know that he's talking about Master Wingfield, the biggest fish in the sea. I glance around to see who else has heard. I see Master Clovel glaring at us, and I wonder how long Captain Smith will remain unshackled if he keeps talking this way about the gentleman. Land ho! I hear the familiar shout. It, it must be another island, but then I hear more. Is this where we drop anchor, Captain, and take all the men on shore? Yes, have the boats and ready the longboat. I run up on deck. They'll be too busy now to catch me. The day's a rare overcast one, and the sails reflect the gray of the sky. The Susan Constant turns, sailors rush to pull on lines, and we are on our way, gliding into shore. As we get closer, I see the tall trees. They've got huge green leaves on, at their tops, and their bare trunks curve upwards, like fingers reaching for the sky. I see a bright green and yellow bird fly from one rooftop to another. Land. I wonder if I'll remember how to walk on it. Fetch the tents. Lower the longboat. Men, gather your belongings. We're going ashore. I gladly, very gladly help load bedding, tents, pots, and pans onto the longboat to be taken ashore. The Godspeed and the Discovery anchor nearby as well, and their men unload. This will be the first time since we left England that all of us, 
all 105 of us men and boys who are passengers and three crews of sailors will be together in one place. There are probably Carib Indians on the island, Captain Newport tells us, but we will give them beads and our soldiers will stand guard and will be safe. I'm one of the last to go ashore. When I finally stand on the white sand, it feels as if moving, it is moving under me. I laugh out loud. More than three months on a ship has confused my legs so much that solid land feels like the rocking deck. Samuel, look, we're Carib Indians, James calls to me. He and Richard have taken off their shirts and they're running naked through the water, splashing each other. I've been waiting for James or Richard or both to tell me how I was wrong and they were right about the Caribs, but neither of them has. I've been on my guard, ready to rough them up if they say one word about it. Are they taunting me now, showing me that what naked Caribs look like, telling me I was wrong not to believe them? Come on, Samuel. James stands in waist-deep water, dripping wet. His skin is peaked pale and his fair hair is plastered against his head. It's salty, he says, and licks some water from his hand. It's fine. Come swim with us. I blink at him. No taunting, no insisting they were right and I was wrong. No hating me for how badly I've treated him and Richard this whole journey. I wonder if James can really be this forgiving or if he's simply so happy to be off that stinking ship he's forgotten the past. Come on in, you prig, calls Richard. You need a good de-lousing. That makes me mad. You're the one who brought the lice onto the ship, I shout. I yank off my shirt and charge into the water. I splash Richard in the face until he begs for breath. When I stop, he is gasping. He smiles a little as if he wants to pretend it was fun, but I know it was not. My eyes dare him to try and splash me back or insult me again. I know he will not. He doesn't want to lose another tooth. Stop, you two, James whines. Look at the fish. He tries his best to distract Richard and me from our quarrel. I feel tickling on my legs. And when I look down into the clear water, I see small blue and yellow fish nibbling on me. The water's warm, so much warmer than the Thames. I want to live here forever, says James. I'd never go back to my septum, my stepmom, ever. She would think I'd died, and that would make her happy. I want to stay here too, says Richard. I wouldn't be cold ever again. I shake my head. I still want to go to Virginia, I say. There's a sack of gold waiting for me there, maybe ten sacks. Reverend Hunt calls for, calls to us from shore. Boys, come here, put your shirts on. The sun will burn your skin. I wish we didn't have to leave the water, but we do what Reverend Hunt says. Disobeying him would be like disobeying God. When we get to shore, he's holding our shirts and three wide-brimmed straw hats. The sun here is like ten English suns, he says. You put these on. Reverend Hunt waits while we pull our shirts over our heads and tie the hat strings under our chins. Now, he says, there's work to be done. There are the tents to be set up. The cook wants all the pots scrubbed with sand. And Captain Ratcliffe wants a path cut to the baths. They've found hot baths in the forest. And he says the gentlemen can't be tromping through the underbrush to get to them. Captain Ratcliffe of the beady eyes and pointed nose. Captain Smith grumbles that he doesn't see why the gentleman can't walk through the forest like anyone else. But Captain Ratcliffe has the power to give orders, not Captain Smith. When we join the others, I see the older boy, Nathaniel. He's holding a hatchet. He must be on his way to help clear the path. I don't want to scrub pots like a woman, so I hurry to get one of the hatchets, too. I swing it a few times to feel its weight and power. I want to do a man's job. Henry, Abram, Nathaniel, and several of the sailors start toward the forest with their hatchets. I follow them. What do we have here? Henry turns to look at me, then stops to block my way. A scrawny chicken coming to work with the men? I don't answer. I want to say I wouldn't be so scrawny if he'd leave more of the food for me. I try to skirt around him and continue on my way, but he puts one powerful arm to stop me. Go back and scrub the pots with the other boys, he growls. You'll only get in the way. He yanks the hatchet out of my hands and cuffs me. I glare at him silently as he turns and walks after the others. What's he going to do with two hatchets? I hope he chops himself in the leg. Reluctantly, I go find the cook. He's already hovering over Richard and James, showing them how to scoop up a handful of sand in a rag and use it to scrub out the mess pots. They haven't had a really good cleaning in three months, so the sand has some hard work to do. I join them, toiling under the hot sun until sweat drips from my face. I wish I could be back playing in the salty sea or swinging a hatchet in the shade of the forest. Suddenly a scream comes from the forest, a man's scream of pain. Soon there's another cry, and then such shouting and shrieking it turns my blood cold. I remember Captain Smith's answer when I asked if the cribs chop people up for their cook pot. Only if they catch them. The path cutters, I shout, it's coming from that direction. Gentlemen and soldiers grab their weapons and hurry toward the terrible sound. James and Richard huddle together behind the largest cook pot. I spot a sword and belt someone has and sell I spot a sword and belt someone has left lying in the sand. Quickly I try to fasten the belt around me. It's too big. I pull the sword out of its sheath and with the bare sword I run toward the sound of the battle. 
Down the newly cut path I go, high stepping over stumps and roots, following the soldiers and gentlemen. We all converge on the path cutters. They're yelling and writhing as if they're fighting invisible demons. Henry's hopping, sweating his arms and neck, shouting in agony. There's not a crib Indian in sight. What is this? Reverend Hunt demands, his voice booming over the cries. What's happening here? Fire, Henry cries. It feels like fire. I jerk my head around, searching the jungle. Have the cribs attacked and run off? Or is it some strange beast? I hold out my sword, ready to fight, but I see nothing. The hatchets are all on the ground. Reverend Hunt reaches to pick one up. No, Reverend, don't touch it. It's Captain Smith's voice. Angry red welts are rising on Henry's arms and neck, on Abram and the others too. To the baths, Captain Smith orders them. That will give you some relief. They take off running, swatting at themselves as they go. It's the machinal tree, Captain Smith says when the things have quieted down. The cribs use its sap to poison their arrows and it burns like fire. Our men must have chopped into it. I'm impressed with Captain Smith's knowledge. As a soldier, he's already traveled the world and has learned so much. Tromping up the newly cut path at that moment is Captain Ratcliffe. His face is dripping with sweat. This all happened, this all happened Captain Smith says loudly, thanks to Captain Ratcliffe and his ridiculous idea of a gentleman's path. Captain Ratcliffe wipes his brow and scowls. It looks to me as if he could he would spit in Captain Smith's face if he weren't so overheated. The two men stare at each other, fuming. Let's go, everyone. Back to your work, Reverend Hunt says. With a wave of his hands, he gets the men moving. It somehow breaks the standoff between Captain Smith and Captain Ratcliffe. Captain Ratcliffe calls after the men. I want a new crew to cut the path. Just leave those blasted manicure whatever trees alone. Captain Smith shakes his head and mumbles angrily under his breath. I walk toward, back toward the stack of mess pots, waiting to be scrubbed. I carry the sword I borrowed. Captain Smith comes up behind me. That needs cleaning, he says. It startles me. I give him a sideways look, then I understand he means the sword. The metal's tarnished and even rusting in some places. I'll show you how to clean it. When you return it, the owner will thank you, he says. On the beach, Captain Smith demonstrates to me how to clean the sword with a rag and sand. He says this sand's fine enough to do the job. It's surprisingly similar to cleaning and polishing mess pots. He orders me to do as he has shown me. I reach for the rag, then I stop. What if I do it wrong? Will he beat me, make a fool of me? I lower my hand. It's better to remain unteachable. If you will not obey me, Captain Smith says in a low, cold voice, there are other crueler men you may serve instead. I clench my teeth. Nothing to do but try. I reach slowly for the rag again, scoop up sand, press it against the sore blade, give it a stroke. I forget to be careful. My finger slides along the blade. I yelp, stick my sliced finger into my mouth and suck on the blood. Captain Smith laughs. Oh, I cut my fingers many times learning to clean a sword. Let me see it, he says. I hold out my finger. It's still bleeding, but the cut's not so deep that it'll stop me from using my hand. Captain Smith rips a strip off the rag and ties it tightly around my finger. Try again, he orders. I look up at him. I did it wrong, and yet he didn't beat me. I pick up the rag again. I'm careful with my fingers this time. I give a short stroke, and another, and another, and soon the rust and the tarnished spots have turned to shine. They gleam in the late afternoon sun. Captain Smith nods. Good, he says. Now return it to its owner before one of these lazy gentlemen calls you a thief. I run off to find the belt and sheath. They're still lying in the sand. I return the sword to its place. That evening I hear hammering, and after a while I go to see what's being built. Have some of the gentlemen decided they need houses instead of tents to sleep in? When I see what it is, my mouth grows dry. A wooden frame, a rope hanging from the highest beam, a noose tied to the rope. Master Wingfield has not forgotten his promise to hang Captain Smith. So go ahead and turn in your chapter six quiz when you're finished. Hope you're staying warm.